Welcome to Bibliophiles Anonymous, episode 25. I'm Denise. And I'm Jess. And today's discussion, we were lucky enough to get an advanced reader copy of A Conspiracy of Alchemist by Liesl Schwartz. So that will be our main discussion for today. And we are very grateful to NetGalley for getting that for us. So thank you, yes. NetGalley. I've really enjoyed working with them. We've gotten a couple of really good books from them, so... We'll have yeah, to. I need to get on there. I haven't browsed through their new stuff lately. I need to look and see if there's anything else that looks promising. Yeah, I, I haven't been on there much either, but uh, we've, we've gotten a couple good things from them, so we'll have to, you know, keep keep looking, because that's fun. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, well, you know, it, it, it's... I like the idea that I have this stuff and can read it before it's actually published. Right. It, it gives me a little thrill. Yeah, because it's... it's it's special. Yeah. You know, so hopefully in the upcoming months we can bring you some more good book reviews of some brand new books just coming out. Uh, this one I do believe is out now. I think it, yeah, it just, came, just out came out last week. I think so. Yeah. Because uh, it was last week when we were recording the podcast, and we were like, what are we going to talk about next week? I don't know. We'll have to come up with something. And then all of a sudden I was on Goodreads. And you know how they'll have, like, the little boxes over on the sides that have little pop-up commercials almost for different books? Yeah. Well, one came up for A Conspiracy of Alchemists, and I looked at it, and I was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> We've got the ARC for that. We never scheduled when we were going to review that on the podcast because we were holding on to it so we could do it closer to when it came out because we actually got yeah. it back in January. Yeah, we have had it for a couple months. Yeah, I, I think it was back in January, but we didn't want to do it all the way back then because we would have been way ahead of the game. But all, I had completely forgotten that we even had it, and all of a sudden it was, it was right there, and I'm thinking, oh, we're in trouble. So, <laughs> so but that we, was, got it, we got it in. Yeah, that was, the, uh, that was the quick Facebook message to you. Can you read a book in a week? <laughs> Cause Granted, we, I did just finish it like, 10 minutes ago, but... Well, I only finished like an hour ago, so... That's just proof that we can... We can speed read anything. Well, see, I could have read it faster if I... I, mean, I could have read it in two days had I just sat down and read it. Right. But I didn't. I would read it at night when I laid down to go to sleep, and you usually sleep. would fall asleep in the process. <laughs> right. I mean, and it's, that's not the book's fault. That's just what happens when I lay down and read. Right. You know, it's I've always done that. Because I've always read at night before I go to bed, I reckon my brain is conditioned that even if it's the middle of the day and I'm not tired, if I lay down in the bed and read, I'm out. Yeah, I wish my I could do that, actually. Usually the opposite happens with me with books. <laughs> well, I mean, if it's something like really, 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 really good that I'm like into and can't put down then I won't go to sleep but you know most of the time I start reading my brain is like oh you're reading it must be bedtime <sighs> you know it's time to relax now everything's going to yeah. shut down yeah well before we talk about this book is there anything else that you're reading right now uh Rhapsody yeah I'm reading that one too <laughs> and I basically just read um, Sorceress of Darshava because I mentioned that I was working on my old ebook copies that aren't really ebooks. They were just Word documents that somebody scanned many, many years ago and they were horrible. And yeah. So I basically had to read Sorceress of Darshava. Well, I know, you, I know you just hated to do that. Oh, yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> and then I basically had to do the same thing with Cirrus of Kel. So, I basically read those two books. So, maybe, you know, that contributes to why it took me a week to read A Conspiracy of Alchemist. Might have something to do with it. I'm not actually counting them, though, because I didn't... I, I mean, I read them, but I didn't read them and try to retain anything from them. It was just basically looking at the words. Right. So, I'm not actually counting them as books that I have read. Although, I'm sure, after we do our Eddings Palooza... I will end up rereading the entire Bulgarian and the Malorian. Yeah, so. I, I don't know if I'm going to read the Malorian this time, because I did just reread that last year. And so did I. Yeah, I, and I'm 
and not that I don't want to, it's just I've got a lot of other books that are sitting here, and I still have books that need to go back to the library that I've now renewed, I think, for a third or fourth time. I'm not sure. Yeah. I've lost count. So I probably need to get those, you know, taken care of. But let's see, I've also been reading Rhapsody by Elizabeth Hayden, like you have. And uh, just so everybody knows, that is the next Tavern Book Club book, and we will be discussing it next week. So yeah. anybody who hasn't started it and wants to join us in the discussion, you might want to get started because it's a fairly long book. Yeah, I'm, and... I'm, I'm not very far into it, so I'm going to have to buckle down and read it. I mean, I've read it before, but it's been so long that I really don't remember a lot about it. I'm not right. like it by like I am by the Bulgarians, which if I don't read those... I can still talk about them because I've read them so many times I could almost recite them. Right. So I'm not real worried about trying to reread those. No, I'm not either. I could I can almost knock those out in a day for each one. Yeah. One because I've read them so many times. But you know, if I don't if I don't read those and finish them before the podcast starts, that's not really a huge deal because I've read them forty seven times. <laughs> right. But Rhapsody, I, on the other hand, I've read once, and it's been years, so... Yeah. Well, I'm about halfway through it, so I'm in pretty decent shape to finish it by next week. So, um, I'm, I'm reading that one. I Technically, technically, I am reading Aborson by Garth Nix, but really all that means is that I have a bookmark stuck somewhere in Chapter 1. <laughs> I started it. I, I really did. And I had every intention of reading it, but that's one of the library books that has been renewed a couple times now because all of this other stuff just came up as I had the Tavern Book Club book that came up and then we had to read this one. So it just has gotten shoved to the wayside, which is really bad because I started it and it starts off with a bang. I mean, like, whoa, seriously. So, um... I, I I do need to find out what happens as soon yeah. as everything else calms down. <laughs> well, I'm going to get around to those eventually, hopefully. Once I get through with Rhapsody and we get through with editing stuff, I will have time to, you know, breathe and read other things. Yeah. Oh, Lyriel was so good. I'm telling you, that one, it was better than the first book. I think I've said that a couple times now in the podcast, but yeah, it was well, the really good. Yeah, the first one was really good. So. Yeah. Well, that's just it. I, he, they really did a, he really did a good job continuing the story. Well, not even continuing the story, because it starts off with completely different characters. I mean, Sabriel's yeah. still there, but she's not the focus anymore. And I think part of it was just, and I, th I think Aborson's kind of doing the same thing, all three pages that I've read so far. Uh, <laughs> but it, it went into a lot more detail about the world and the magic involved. And that was my only real complaint about Sabriel is I got confused a couple times yeah, as to what they were talking about. And sometimes authors do that and it drives me crazy where they'll just talk about, especially with fantasy and science fiction, you where you have this whole other world or universe or planet or what have you. But they just will mention something that's probably very common there, but I have no idea what it is. And so they don't yeah. describe it because all of the characters know what it is, and they just, like, throw a random thing out there and then move on. I'm like, wait, what, what was that? What does that mean? But they don't tell you. And eventually yeah. you pick it up just after reading it several times, you're like, okay, well, that must be what they're talking about. It must be a, a kind of bird or something. I don't know. Yeah, but I've had that problem yeah. with Sabriel, too. The, yeah. You know, the whole charter magic and free magic. and Yeah. But I didn't have that problem with Lyriel, partially because I had already read Sabriel, so I had at least an idea of what things were called and so I could put it together. But there was so much more detail added to it that it all... Like, I almost want to go and reread Sabriel now, but I understand more. But yeah. I'm not going to because I don't have time. <laughs> yeah. That's one of those that, you know, later when you don't have so much on your plate, you well, can contemplate rereading. And luckily, luckily I, I own a copy of Sabriel. I found it at the used bookstore for, like, $2 or something ridiculous. Uh, yeah. So 
I, I don't have to worry about returning that one to the library. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's always helpful. You know, I can just pick it up and read it once my book stack on my desk here goes down to more appropriate levels, which is going to be a while. Well, but, you know, I'm usually better about reading than I have been because I would go to the library every week. And the way my library is, you can only check out five hardbacks at a time. You can check out five hardbacks and ten paperbacks, but you can only check out five off the regular shelf at one time. Uh huh. I would check out five every time I went and would read them in a week and take them back. Because hmm. the librarians were all like, I don't know how you do this. I'm like, well, I really don't have a lot else to do. Right. But, you know, I've actually had a, a life here for the past few weeks. Really? But I've actually, you know, it, there for a while I didn't see my best friend that much because, you know, I, I'm not working and I don't have money and I can't drive my car. But the last few weeks I've actually been, been spending a little more time with her. So that whole real life thing kind of gets in the way sometimes. Yeah. Well, some of my time's going to start getting a bit more compressed up in the next like two months or so because as of tomorrow I will and I it almost pains me to say this as of tomorrow I will officially be a soccer mom (laughs) (laughs) my daughter who I love dearly told me that her new year's resolution for this year was to become a YMCA soccer champion Okay. This was after I had never heard her even mention soccer before, except in passing because they did it at the little summer camp thing she went to. And basically they just had a ball and kind of kicked it around. I don't think they actually played with actual rules. It was just, you know, go out and have fun. And that's soccer. So we signed her up for this little, like, eight-week season that they're doing and just to kind of see how she likes it. But at the same time, it's like, you know, I'm glad because it's good exercise and it's, you know, I'd like to get her involved in something, but at the same time, I'm just like, I'm going to be a soccer mom. <laughs> I need to go buy a minivan now. <sighs> if, if, if soccer doesn't work out, you could always, you know, try for softball. Well, the other thing she had talked about was swimming. Uh, and then she had also talked about doing dance, too, so I don't know, but... This is the first thing we're trying, and we'll see. I don't want to be one of those moms where there's, like, an activity every single night, and there's, like, you know, craziness. I'm like, one thing at a time, and if you don't like that, we'll move on to something else until we find something you do like, but we're not going to go crazy with it. Yeah. So, but we'll see. My thing thing was always, well, I started in kindergarten and first grade. I played t-ball. Uh-huh. And if I had it to do over... I wouldn't have quit after T-ball, but I was, uh, the next step was uh, coach pitch, which meant the coach pitched to us and we had to hit the ball. And for some reason, I didn't want to do that and I quit. Mm -hmm. And if I had it to do over, I wouldn't have, I would have stayed and I would have played all the way through high school because I did play independent league when I was a sophomore and then I actually played for the school my senior year. I was like, I am not going to graduate this high school without doing something. <laughs> so I actually played softball for the school. And I loved it. It was just one of those things that I really, really, really enjoyed. And that is why I'm a baseball nut. Or maybe maybe watching the Braves with my dad is why I love softball. I don't really know. Kind of a chicken and an egg problem. Yeah. But I miss it. And if I could find a job... And find a co-ed team. I would so play again. See, I never did any kind of... Or not... I didn't really do any kind of sports stuff. I was more into, like, the music and... And that sort of thing. In fact, there was one time where I... I told my... I I was playing flute and I was taking private lessons. And I told my teacher that I was playing... What was I playing? I think it was volleyball with some friends at church or something. And he was like you can't play volleyball, you're going to hurt your hands, and all this other stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's right, I could hurt my hands. And then I wouldn't be able to play my instruments. Like, I was playing, like, three instruments at the time. So (laughs) I just kind of didn't, I never even really gave sports much thought because I was always worried about, because I did hurt my hand. I, I broke my hand once, and then I got it run over by an ice skate, which, that was fun. And Ow! 
It, yeah. Let's just say it started with a game of Crack the Whip, if you know what that means. Yeah. Um, and uh, ended up with me falling down and one of my best friends also going flying and going right over my hand. And I didn't even notice it until I looked down and because everything was so cold. I looked down and I saw like all the blood and I'm like, ah! So that was fun. But yeah, so yeah. I've always been like really nervous, like doing things that could hurt my hands because I still play piano and it's, you know, it's hard to do that if you injure like your hands or you break your yeah. finger or something like that. I'm well, not saying you know, it's I impossible took... because I did, but <laughs> it's difficult. I took piano lessons once and it just, it didn't stick. I love music. I will be the first to tell you that music is a very big part of my life. I just have no musical talent whatsoever. <laughs> Um, I apparently, I apparently do, or at least that's what people tell me. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I don't... It runs in my family. It just skipped me. Look, I can't even sing well, so no, not even passably well. I en I enjoy it. I just and I hope that I do like well, like singing for example. I hope I do it at least reasonably well because I do it around the house all the time, so. Oh, well, I do it, and I sing in the shower at the top of my lungs all the time. I just, I'm aware that I cannot carry a tune to save my life. I thought I was tone deaf, but I realize that I can't carry a tune, so I'm probably not tone deaf. No, if you know it, then you're probably not tone deaf. <laughs> if you can hear Oh, yeah, I know it. I sound horrible. If you can hear that it's bad, then you know. <laughs> well, we have gone but, off yeah. on a tangent here, and that was fun. So <laughs> <laughs> We do that a lot. <laughs> So now you know a little bit more about us. Uh, we're kind of crazy, but you knew that already. Yeah, but that's what makes it fun. Yeah. So let's go ahead and start talking about A Conspiracy of Alchemists by Liesl Schwartz. And this book, I really enjoyed it. It, it took me a while to get into it, though. For me, it, it's not necessarily even that it started off slow. It just kind of... It took a little bit of time to catch my interest. It finally did, but it just it, it took me a little while. How about you? See, I liked ah, I liked it pretty well, pretty well towards the beginning. I mean, Mr. Marsh and Elle's relationship from the very beginning reminded me a lot of Jericho Barons and Michaela Lane from Karen Marie Moaning's Fever series. Mm-hmm. The, the the dynamic between them and and the type of person that he was and it it reminded me a lot of that and I love those books they were complete fluff but I liked them <laughs> there's nothing wrong with fluff sometimes I think because of that I was more inclined to like the conspiracy of alchemists but I thought the story was really good the idea of you know her being a pilot when that wasn't the sort of thing, proper thing for women to do right? at that time. Right. I always like to see books that have female characters that kind of do things that they really shouldn't be doing by society standards or whatever. Right. No, I liked her as a character, but there was a bunch, there were some things that really kind of annoyed me <laughs> with her. <laughs> um, well, to start off, she's hired at, at the beginning, she's hired by a, uh, her friend Patrice, uh, who now is he the one who owns that cafe? No, I think Ale Alex or Alex, the the vampire. Okay. I think he's the one that actually owned it. Okay, she was just meeting Patrice there, and yeah. he had hired her to uh, transport something, this box. And she thought it was gonna be a simple job that she's doing for a friend and you know, former customer, and then everything just goes to pot, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, it goes a little haywire. Yeah, uh, she gets attacked, the box gets stolen, and next thing you know, she's in the middle of this whole big, well, conspiracy, really. <laughs> she gets uh, she gets to the airfield, and they take off of the uh, Patrice and her and uh, this friend of his named Mr. Marsh. Uh, we find out later his first name is Hugh. We also find out later that he's, uh, was he a, a Viscount? Uh, yeah. 
I think so. He was he was in, he had a title. Uh, I I can't remember exactly what it is now. Um, but uh, yeah, so now all of a sudden they have left Paris and they're basically being attacked at the airfield <laughs> trying to get them to stay. And they take off, and Elle, of course, at this point is kind of freaking out because she's just completely broken all of the rules of her her job, of her career as a pilot. And she's with these two people, one of whom she knows, the other one she doesn't and doesn't trust at all. <laughs> yeah, she she really just doesn't like him at the beginning of the book. <laughs> not at all, not even a little bit. Well, I don't blame her because I didn't either. To be honest. Well, I didn't... I Well, no, I didn't really trust him at the beginning either. I was just like, what are you up to? Yeah, you could tell he was up to something, that there was something about him, but you didn't know... You didn't have any idea what. So they end up in Oxford, I believe, because they go to her house. Yeah. Her family's house, where they find out that her father has been kidnapped. Which is never good. No, no. But this does lead to one of my pet peeves about the book, I guess. Um, I mean, part of the book is her trying to find out what happened to her father. That's a that's a fairly would you agree? That's a fairly big plot point. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's kind of a a major big plot deal. point. Yeah. But it seemed for a a fairly good long part of the book that she wasn't thinking about her father at all because she was yeah, kind she... of talking you know she was kind of mixed up with mr marsh and you know getting all like flirtatious a couple times and i'm like really i'm sorry if one of my parents or any family member was kidnapped and in danger i'm not going to be thinking about the good looking guy sitting next to me who may or may not be keeping me from finding my you know loved one who has gone missing. I'm going to be knocking down everything possible to try and find that person. Yeah. I'm not going to I care mean, about the guy. I don't care how good looking and charismatic or whatever he is. I'm not going to care. I'm going to be looking for my whatever it is, dad, mother, cousin, whoever. And so yeah. and there was just well, a lot of that and it 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 bothered me. Well, you know, you, that she finally does, you know, basically threaten him at gunpoint and goes off on her own because she wants to find her father. She finally comes to her senses. But this is along about the part of the book where I wanted to smack her for that whole petulant attitude of, I'm not the Oracle, you're crazy, I'm not going to do this, this is not possible. But at the same time, she's telling herself, well, this explains a lot. Right. I'm like... Oh my god! Come on now! Well, backing it up just a little bit, um, we find out, basically, that the people who have been attacking her are uh, the alchemists. And, and this, I'm going to need your help to explain this, because it was, I don't want to say it wasn't fully explained, it was explained a little bit, but there, this is a world, and it's, kind of it's slightly steampunk but it's also very much fantasy because you have vampires you have fairies uh, yes she has a fairy that's trapped in her a bracelet that she's wearing um, and we get to hear from the fairies like point of view a little bit which is kind of neat but yeah, I thought that part was really cool yeah the bits that the fairy would interject and... I felt sorry for the little fairy I kind of did too she was not doing well at least I think it was a she yeah, she was. Um, well, it was hard to tell at times. <laughs> well, but um, I think I think at the end when she was dealing with with Hugh that it was it was a girl, but it, at first when yeah. they were sitting in the bracelet, I mean, how could you tell? But yeah. anyway, so you have the this magic system. It's divided into light and shadow, which that's fairly common, and the alchemists they're on the side of the shadow. But I, I had a hard time understanding exactly. They were they were trying to gain more prominence. They were trying to gain more power. Well, it's because they were basically enslaved by the vampires. Okay. 
they were the vampire servants. They had basically agreed to care for the vampires and, and watch out for them and, and basically be their slaves. I mean, that's kind of what the alchemists were. And basically they wanted to throw off the yoke of the vampires and wanted to be equals with the vampires rather than being subservient to them. Okay. So that's why they wanted to release all this power so that they would have access to it so that they wouldn't have to bow down to the vampires anymore. Okay. Or, you know, anyone else for that matter. Right. They wanted to be the, you know, top people on the totem pole. Yeah. So <clears throat> you have all of the, the creatures of shadow, which is your vampires, and they kind of consider the fairies to be in that mix as well. Um, but then you have the, the people who are on the light side of magic, which is the warlocks. And you do find out that Hugh Marsh is a warlock, which immediately makes Elle not trust him. Except, of course. Except when she does, because she keeps going back and forth. Yeah. Which is another thing that made me want to slap her. It's like, make up your mind. Either trust him and go with it, which, I mean, you probably should, because he does care for you, but... Don't go keep going back and forth and be like, oh, he's so nice and he's taking care of me too. Oh, he is a slime ball and I don't trust a thing, single thing that he says. It was, she just kept going back and forth from one extreme to the other. I'm like, pick a side. <laughs> yeah. I don't even care which side you pick at this point, but pick one. And basically, she doesn't trust the warlocks because of what happened with her mother. Right. Her mother is dead. And had died a long time ago. And she had thought that her mother had gotten involved in some sort of cult or something like that. But what actually happened is that her mother was an oracle. Yeah. And basically what that in this world means is that she is kind of a channel for the Council of Warlocks to have power. And they, right. they also prophesy and, and do other things, but that's... Their you know, basically the, the traditional Greek oracle right. stuff is thrown in there. And there's three different levels of... Before you actually get to oracle, first you're a, a sibyl, and then you're a, a... I think a Pythia. Yeah. And then you become oracle. And I think at this point they pretty much established that Elle is a Pythia at that point and hasn't undergone the final transformation. So now... Well, actually, huh? I think at the very beginning when Hugh first finds her, she wasn't even a Pythia yet. Oh, she may not have been. She wasn't because she became a Pythia when she was after she was kidnapped. Was it after she was kidnapped or was it when she went with Hugh to that island where the monks were? That's true. It could have been then. It because, was one of the because she because she had kind of a prophecy vision thing happen with in that room with the big mosaic on the floor. Yeah. So that might have been it too. But but basically they established that she's supposed to be the next oracle and so now Elle is thinking, okay, the warlocks want to use me for something. The alchemists want to use me for something. Um I still don't know whether I want to trust Hugh or not. Uh, screw all this. I'm going to go find my dad. <laughs> yeah. It was the gist of it. And quite frankly, I didn't blame her. In fact, I was saying you should have made that decision a while back. But yeah, that's well, just you me. Know. Well, you know, these, these reluctant heroes usually don't want to save the world. No. You know, they don't care. They're like, you know, it's not possible. I'm not who you think I am. Yeah. I'm going to go yeah. here now. Or I don't want this responsibility. You're trying to make me have this responsibility and I don't want it. Or I have other things that I need to take care of. Basically. Yeah. Which, you know, were I in that situation and the choices were save the world or save one of my parents, I would probably go for saving one of my parents because... You know, that's just what you do. Right. But she, um, she basically marches him out. It's when they went, when he took her to the place with the mosaic floor. She basically marches him out of there at gunpoint. And 
gets herself a room in a different hotel and decides that she's going to her father. Well, he sends her a ticket on the Orient Express to get her where she needs to go. A first class ticket because she was worried about how she was going to get the money to get on the train to get, you know, to where what Constantinople. That's mm-hmm. where they went. Yeah. But what he failed to mention to her was that he was waiting for her on the train. And she wasn't exactly happy to see him either. <laughs> no, she was not. <laughs> Which I wouldn't have been either. No. But still, it was kind of funny. What are you doing here? And then she opens the door and he's going to jump off the train. <laughs> I'm like, really? That's not smart. No. But that was one thing that I did really like about the book is that you kind of got to travel to all of these very interesting and exotic places. Like you spent yeah. some time in Paris. and But it's a different Paris than what we're used to because everything I mean it's, it takes place in real world places it's just got this fantasy steampunky vibe to it and yeah. so you got to spend time in England and you got to spend time in uh, Constantinople and I think the train ended up in they also oh they were in Vienna and what was the other place Venice Venice yeah um, I was like it's another V it's Venice yeah um, <laughs> So you you got to visit all of these places, which is really cool. But at the same time, especially when they, I can't remember, I can't believe I didn't remember Venice because that was one of the places I was so irritated with her <laughs> because you know they're going out to dinner and they're riding in a gondola and all this stuff. And I thought what I was saying, come on, your father is missing. They could be doing horrible things to them, him because they're bad bad people, and you're. Going out to dinner and taking gondola rides. Yeah. Don't do that. (laughs) Yeah, that was kind of a... You're being silly. Come on. You're being a silly girl. Now stop Mm. it. You're you're being a girly girl when we already know you're not supposed to be a girly girl. You're supposed to be a tough girl who, you know, flies a airship and has her own revolver. You're not a girly girl. Oh, excuse me. Not to mention the dagger she keeps tucked in the laces of her corset. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. I have to admit. Yeah, she she did kind of tend to get, you know, wishy-washy between the whole girly girl and the tough girl thing. She's like she couldn't make up her mind what she really wanted to be. Right. And, and I'm sitting going, stick with the tough girl! Yeah. That and See, that, that bouncing back and forth was another thing that kind of irritated me. But, um... I mean, Hugh kind of did it, too. At first, he was, they were all about, well, they have to get this box back because it has this oh, substance. I think it's called Karmots. Yeah. Um, that the alchemists were going to use to make a Philosopher's Stone, and they were afraid that if that happens, then they would be able to get all of this power and all the things that Philosopher's Stones are supposed to do, turn lead into gold, uh, make the elixir of life to make you live forever, and all these things are powers that you don't want the bad guys to have. And now they have the means to make it. So that was, like, his first goal, was to get this stuff back. And then her father was mixed up somehow into it, so that kind of got incorporated in it. He stayed a little bit more with the goal until he found out about what the council's plans were. Yeah. Cause they basically said that we know that she's the Oracle or she's going to become the Oracle and we want her because if she's going to be the receptacle for all of this power, then she needs to be in the hands of the council of warlocks and nobody else. And they have an oracle, and she's really, really old, and she was never a very good one. But she was the only one they had after Elle's mom was killed. So they figure, okay, well, we'll we'll work with this woman, but she's really old, and she's really weak and feeble. And Elle gets to meet her, and the first thing that the lady does is try and suck some of her life force out so that she can be younger again. I was like, okay, that's nice. <laughs> oh, yes, it was thrilling. And then there's the whole, you know, bit right after that when they're back on the train and they meet Hugh's uh, vampire friend. I liked and her. She, 
I did too. And she tells Elle all about, you know, Hugh's relationship with this oracle. Yeah, apparently there had been uh, kind of a romance between them at one point because warlocks live a lot longer than regular humans do. And even though the oracle has all of this power, they're still basically a regular human in some respects. They don't have a longer lifespan. They grow older and die at a fairly normal time frame. So yeah. he's had to watch her age and then have to leave her to go off and, and do all of his other things he does as a warlock, which I'm not sure what all of that is, but... He goes off to do warlock he, things. He goes off to do warlock things. And so, you know, part of that is she's she's older and she's not able to do her job, but then she's also seeing this pretty young thing now standing at the side of her man, or who used to be her man. So, yeah, Elle gets quite a quite an education from from Hugh's vampire lady friend who what was her name Le- Leona, I think, or yeah. something like that. I know it started with an L. I think it was Leona. But no, she was I'm... she was neat and it was it was funny because Elle had never met one of the, they're called night walkers. Yeah. She had never met one before and so the whole time she was just kind of nervous, but at the same time uh, Leona, she was just so, you know, much like a normal, you know, giggly girl, kind of. You know, she was ready to sit down and gossip and to play card games. And, you know, Elle says at one point, she's like, well, who would have ever guessed that I'm going to sit here and play gin rummy with a Nightwalker on the Orient Express? I mean, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking, that's not fair. I want to play cards with a vampire on the Orient Express. But, you know, my life is not a fantasy novel, so... No, no, the closest thing we can get is reading them. As many of them as possible. But eventually, unfortunately, uh, Hugh has to leave and take care of some things, and Elle gets captured by the bad Which, people. Which, you know, she makes a valiant effort not to. She shoots somebody. She Yeah, she did a very, very good job trying to trying to get away. Um, but she ends up in the place where the alchemists have kind of set up their headquarters and basically in chains in this kind of round room that's completely empty and it's just her and in her nightgown basically because they took her at night or right early in the morning maybe. I don't remember exactly, but she was didn't have anything. She had her gun, but they took it away from her. And all she has is her bracelet and her fairy friend. There's not much help. No, well, see, the problem is that the fairies, they they live off, well, they, they can... They're they can, fairies. Yeah, they can, and they can live off other alcohol, but um, they really need some of the, the absence to survive. The wormwood. Yeah, and she hasn't had any in a really long time because she's been stuck in the bracelet. So, and Elle can't talk to her really either. She doesn't speak fairy. No. And so, basically, she has to send out this little fairy and hope that it's going to do some kind of good. (laughs) Which, you know, turns out it kind of does. Eventually. It runs into here. But not after getting caught by a bread seller and then taken to a restaurant and put in a bird cage. I mean, this is a poor little fairy. Yeah, she kind of had it rough there she for gets, a while. She gets locked in a jar and everybody's staring at her and like jiggling the jar around. And she's like, this is not any fun anymore. <laughs> yeah. And then I the, kind of felt sorry for her. Oh, I felt so bad for the poor little thing. And she's weak besides. And then the one guy who's like, I'm going to give... She's like, You're, I'm going to take you home and give you to my children. And she's thinking, oh, great. Children like to pull the wings off fairies and torture us in all kinds of different ways. Great. That's that's awesome. Yeah. But then well, ends up getting picked up by the, by the authorities, basically, who are getting ready to kick Hugh out of the country because they didn't want any 
shadow people around and they're like, yeah, and take this with you when you leave because it's one of those creatures. And he was like, okay. <laughs> now all of a sudden yeah. I have a fairy. <laughs> and he finds out that, you know, she was in the bracelet and that she knows where Ellie is. And this part, and... this part I thought was funny because she's trying to describe it and they can't, uh, Hugh is trying to understand fairy, but it's not working very well because the fairy's not communicating very well. And so finally she just starts spelling stuff out and she's dumping like a whole bunch of sugar on the table and spelling things out and tells him to find an old tower with a tree outside. Yeah. Cause they're, they're in, not, they're in Constantinople. So you have to go find an old tower with a tree outside. And so he's staying kind of at this warlock safe house sort of place. And he asks the the proprietor's son where he can find a tower with a tree out front. And the kid's like, uh, there's a lot of those. There's a lot of them about, mate. <laughs> and so they, they get a map and they're like, there's, look, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here, there's one here. And it takes forever. But they finally find it. But it takes a really... A lot of diligence to track it down. Yeah, but they finally do. And he has to try to figure out how to get inside of said tower. And by this point, you know, he and Elle both have admitted that they're in love with each other. Took just not to them. each other. Took them long enough. I know. Everybody else is like, oh my god, come on. The whole audience is, you know, wanting to slap both of them. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and, you know, she's like, I'll never get to apologize for the things I said to him. And he's, you know, decided that he's in love with her. And and he's ready um, to, and he's ready to defy the council for her. Yeah. Leave the council because he doesn't want them using her and basically turning her into the same kind of jaded and bittered woman like the last oracle was. Yeah. Which you can't really blame him. No. Would have been nice if he had thought that, you know, before getting them involved in all this mess, but... This is true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nobody's perfect. This is also true, especially <laughs> not a man. But, uh, basically not to give too much away about the ending, because, you know, it was fairly spectacular. Yes. The ending... Yeah, to, to make a long story short, he rides in and saves the day. Yeah. So, and, and, it, and I must say, I did not expect the... I mean, we knew who one of the bad guys was, but there's also a bad guy that was in the guise of a good guy. Yes, that was a nice little twist there. I did not see that coming. I didn't either. I did not, not even a little bit. And it's, especially for us who read so much of this kind of stuff, to to pull the wool over our eyes is pretty impressive. So, yeah. you know, bravo, Liesl Schwartz. Yeah, we're very genre savvy when and, it comes to this kind of thing. And we look for that kind of stuff. You know, I was, I for the longest time, I was expecting Marsh to turn into a bad guy. Yeah. Because he was showing so much attention to her, and it's like, okay, is that real feeling, or is he just trying really hard to win her over and get her to trust him? So I was prepared for him to all of a sudden turn bad. Was not prepared for the other guy. Not yeah, at all. Yeah, I was just like, whoa, wait, what? What are you doing here? You're supposed to be someplace else. Oh. Yeah. Oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, that was my reaction. I was like, Huh? <laughs> no, what? I was so not expecting that one at all. No. But I do like, you know, the fact that at the end, you know this is not over. Oh no. Cuz even it's even though even happen. though some of the some of the bad guys have been conquered and some of them are gone completely, uh there's a lot more going on that's you know, a even wider uh, implications than yeah. what they've seen here. And especially with Hugh deciding to defy the council uh, 
that's going to come back to bite them. You know that that's not yeah. over yet. And, oh, no, definitely not. You know, I, and I have a feeling there's a lot of people from this book that we haven't seen the last of either. Oh, yeah. Including the one that surprised us all to pieces, you know. Oh, yeah. Because he's definitely. not gone. <laughs> nope. But yeah, it, well, you know, if nothing else, we know this is book one in the Chronicles of Light and Shadow, which kind of implies that there's going to at least be a book two. Well, probably. Actually, so, I don't know. Let me see if they have anything on Goodreads about a, further books in the series. Well, I mean, this one just came out, so there may not be. Um, Actually, no. Um, She has a book two that's... Uh, well, this one says it was published 2003, too. Oh, it's coming out in August. Ah. And it's called A Clockwork Heart. So that, that could get interesting. There you go. Doesn't have any other I details, have, but... Uh, I may have to look into that one. We may, I'll, I'll, need, I'll check NetGalley and see okay. if we might be able to get book two. Hopefully we won't get it and then forget it until the last <laughs> minute again. But yeah, I... I this is a series that I definitely want to follow. I mean, she's a new author. Right. This is this you is know, her first book, according to Goodreads, so... Yeah. You know, first off, congratulations, because, you know, getting your first book out there is pretty exciting. And, and I mean, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a very good first effort, and usually, if a first book is that good, they usually only get better. Yes, that's true. So, I will definitely have to follow this series and see where it goes. I was, I mean, I really enjoyed the book. I, I was being a little bit critical, don't get me wrong, but uh, there's a lot of, there were a lot of things I really liked. I really enjoyed this, this world. Um, there were yeah. a couple places where I thought it, it, it kind of dragged a little bit, but I mean, sometimes, sometimes it just happens. Um, did Elle kind of get on my nerves sometimes? Absolutely. Was she supposed to? I think so. I think she was supposed to yeah. keep bouncing back and forth. And plus she's pretty young. So, yeah, well, you know, she's only human, too, yeah. so, so well, um, not technically, but you know what I mean. <laughs> she's she's mostly human. She's somewhat human. She was raised human? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of going to bring up the nature-nurture discussion. Well, see, the kind, of, um, the kind of books that we read, sometimes being somewhat human, or at least being raised human, is all we can count on. <laughs> well, that's true. So we just got to go with it. But yeah, I would, I definitely want to to read the next one and find out, you know, what's going on because there's a lot. There was a lot of, a lot of things were wrapped up, but there was also a lot of things that were left wide open. So. Oh yeah. Well, it it wasn't so much a matter of left wide open. It was a matter of we're gonna tie all of this up nice and neat, but bam, you're gonna have this to look forward to in the next one. Yeah. Which you know. It's probably a good idea when you're a new author and you don't really know how long you're going to continue to be published. Right. You know, if you're an established author like Mercedes Lackey, you can write a cliffhanger because you know you're going to get to write the next one. Right. You know, but hopefully hers will sell well and she'll be able to complete the series. And I hope so. Yeah, because... You know, if if I find another series that the author wrote, you know, six books of an eight book series and then never wrote the last two, I'm going to get angry. Oh yeah, because that happened to you, didn't it? That happened with the Elizabeth Hayden books. Oh great. <laughs> so why she did wrote... you make me write the? Why did you make me read them now? <laughs> so I can be frustrated too. Yes, yeah, so I'm not alone. Okay. She wrote six books. She wrote. The Symphony of Ages, the original trilogy. Then she wrote two more that was a duology. And then she wrote the first book in a new trilogy that went with them. And never wrote the last two. Well, I thought it was because she took a break from those to write a set of young adult books. The Lost Journals of Van Polyphane. Which is a character, they're set in the same universe. It's a character that's mentioned in Rhapsody's world and time he's mentioned in those books and but they're young adult which you know i got them and read them well apparently she didn't even finish that series she wrote three of them and there were supposed to be four 
because my copy of the third one even says in the front of it that book four coming soon and has the title of it in there and it was never written. And I don't know what happened to her. Her website is gone. There's no information at all. Huh. It's like the woman just evaporated. Wow. That's odd. I mean, and no, nothing says that she died. I looked up, I mean, I, I, I Google every now and then to see if I can find any information. And the last thing I found was sometime in 2012, I found a post on a message board somewhere that said that she was still alive and that she was still writing. And I'm like, but it's been like six years since the last book came out. <laughs> How does she even still have a contract? Right. How has her publisher not dropped her? Unless it was for a medical reason, you know, she got sick or something and couldn't write. I don't know. But still, I'm like, you do, but duh, you, you, <laughs> you need to tell your fans what's going on here. I mean, I can understand you may not want to give them all the details, but just say, you know, look, some stuff has come up, so the books are going to be postponed. Right. Don't just let your website go away and don't tell anybody anything yeah. a fun fact though about these books that i just remembered apparently when she was doing research for them she came to alabama and stayed at a place in i can't remember if it's in huntsville or athens i think it's kind of between the two called the king's inn and it's in one of in the in the thanks in the beginning of one of the books that she mentions the king's inn oh really and i I've actually driven past that place. I've never actually been there, but we drove past it one day. Cool. So I thought that was really neat. I was yeah. like, of all the places she could go to research for this book, she comes here. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I'm like, it's, it's Alabama. There's nothing here but a bunch of rednecks. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are going to be reading her book next week. Yes. Hopefully I can finish it. <laughs> Look, you're ahead of me. Oh, yeah, but you have, have more time to read than I do. Well, this is also true. I have got to buckle down and read it, though, because, I mean, it's a 600-and-something page book. It's going to take a minute. Yeah. But, well, like I said, I'm halfway through it, so I should probably be able to do it. I'm going to try and get a lot of reading in this weekend because I don't think... Well, I'll talk to you later. My phone just went off. I forgot to put it on silent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, ah, shut up. <sighs> Anyway, I, I don't think <laughs> anyway. I don't think I have anything going on this this weekend too too pressing. So I should be able to spend some time getting caught up on it. Cause like you, I've been reading it mostly at night. Cause I've been trying to read both of these books, finishing them, and so I was reading Alchemists during the day and then Rhapsody in the evening. But I maybe should have switched those because Rhapsody is a lot longer, and I've not been spending more time reading it. But yeah, that's okay. I mean, I've all of this, my reading goal for this year of reading stuff that's on my shelf that I've never read, I'm kind of sucking at this. <laughs> I need to work on that. Hopefully, like I said, I don't know. I will probably read the Bulgariad because it. I read it. It's year before last was the last time I read the Bulgariad. But those won't take me long. Hopefully, no. once we get past those and Rhapsody, because Rhapsody is such a big book, I'm going to have to reread A Discovery of Witches. I that still, one's pretty thick, too. I still need to find that one. Because that's, that that's, that's going to be a tavern book club book, too. Yeah, I have that. I just have to get it back from Holly. Okay. Who's had it for almost three years. <laughs> yeah, she needs to give it back now. <laughs> and hasn't read it. <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> she does that. She'll take books. Oh, I'm going to read this three years later. Did you ever read this? No. Well, I'm taking it home with me then. <laughs> know where it's at if you really want to read it. Yeah, well, that's a, that's, like I said, that's a book club book. Oh, I'm not sure exactly when, when that one is. Is that our next one after Rhapsody? I think it is. Okay. So that'll be for April then. Yeah, because I think, I well, think... Although we're not going to discuss it in April, because we'll discuss it probably the first week of May, I, I think is what we're talking Yeah, about. that's, because I, yeah, when I messaged you on Facebook, I said we should do that the first podcast in May, since it's the April book of the month. Okay. 
All right, so yeah, so next week is Rhapsody, and then the week after that we start our Belgariad month, uh, starting with Pawn of Prophecy and then going through the next four books of the series. And then the week after that will be, yeah, it's uh, Discovery of Witches, which will be on May 5th. So now uh, you all know what our next month and a half plan is. Wow, we have a month and a half plan. That's crazy. We never, yeah, we're never that organized. <laughs> no, we <laughs> might know what we're going to talk about a week before we talk about it. But it's not guaranteed. No, sometimes it it's like, change. what are we going to talk about tonight? <laughs> Oh, yeah. But we're set for right now, so that's good. Yeah. And we hope... And that'll give us some time to find more topics to add to the end of that. Yes. And uh, we hope that we all will, y'all will join us on for Edding's Month, or Belgariad Month. We need a neat name for it. Yeah. Well, I kind of liked Edding's Palooza. Uh, Edding's Palooza. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, join us for our Edding's Palooza starting March 31st. And yes. join us next week for Rhapsody as well, if you are so inclined. We're going to have fun with that one, I think, because there's a lot of things that I like about the book, and there's also some things that are driving me insane. So oh, yeah. um, most people enjoy when I go insane. So, hey, come join <laughs> us then. Um, but we are good for the next little bit, but we do still need some topic suggestions. So Or book recommendations. Or Anything. book recommendations, yes. We are, we are looking for... Any kind of feedback as well to give us an idea. We still are, I mean, we're still fairly new, although we've been doing this for a little while now. And uh, we would still like to get some feedback. Um, we would like also maybe if you would be willing to leave us a nice little review on iTunes. It doesn't take very long, just a couple seconds. Drop a little note in there saying that you like our show and like what we're trying to do here. And... Uh, to give us any feedback, if you want to have any message read aloud on the show, we would love to do that too. You can reach us in a couple different ways. Our email address is bibliophiles.podcast at gmail.com. Or you can find us on Twitter. We are at bibanonpodcast. And by the time the podcast is up, the uh, book of the month post for Rhapsody will be up over at the Malorian Tavern. And the website for that is www.maltavrn.com. And you can also always leave us comments, questions, feedback, or whatever you'd like at our official website, which is www.bibliophiles-anonymous.com. You can also find us on YouTube. Oh, yes. We also have the podcast on YouTube because I know some people prefer listening to it that way. Yeah, some people, as amazing as this is, some people don't use iTunes, you know. Yeah. That's, I mean, I have an iPhone. I kind of have to use iTunes. But I've been using iTunes longer than that. So, I mean, that's where I subscribe to all of my podcasts. And I know Marita at the Tavern, she prefers to listen to them on YouTube. Because you, and I can understand that. You don't need any special software. All you need is a browser and an internet connection. Yeah. So, if you have, you know, any friends who might like to listen to us but don't do the whole podcast thing, you know, they don't have an iPod, MP3 player, what have you, they don't use iTunes or anything like that, you can always uh, forward them to our YouTube channel and they can just listen that way and it's easy. Uh, you, you can also listen to us straight from our website. We do have links there that play each show um, each post for the show has one for that particular topic, so uh, you can. There's a bunch of ways you can listen to us. We just we're all over the place. We are. We try to make it easy. We don't want anybody to have to go looking. There's no. lots of different ways you can find us. Yeah, so, we are here and yeah. here and here and here and here. <laughs> yes. So we just want you to listen. That's all. Yeah. And you know maybe drop us a little review here and there, or rate, or subscribe to us, or you know participate. Yeah. Anything like that. So. I think that's going to do it for this week. I think so. And uh, we will see you guys next week when we talk about Rhapsody. Yep. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you then. Bye. Bye.